Welcome back to season three of Snubs and Dubs, where we're talking about the snubs and dubs of the 74th Academy Award for Best Picture. I'm your host, Kyle Tobias, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Miller. Jason, how's it going? Kyle, it's going as good as the last episode. Wow. Because that was mere minutes ago. Because <laughs> yeah. you're going on vacation. Yes, I am going on vacation. Yeah. And I probably will have already had my vacation at this point. Wow. Wow. I hope so. Yeah. Something went wrong if you didn't. So. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I saved one of my what I watched last week from last week for this week. So that next week will be more fresh of mind for this week. Because it, it'll come together. One sec. So I watched Beetlejuice. Oh, nice. Which I had never seen before. So it was my first okay. time. Had okay. you seen Beetlejuice I'm before? I'm perking up. I have. It's kind of okay. a Halloween mainstay. Okay. Which brings me to the question of, Kyle, it's August 19th. <laughs> Why did you watch Beetlejuice? Because there is a Broadway production of Beetlejuice that oh. we are going to be attending. So Good I play. thought Good I would play. watch the movie before because mm-hmm. I heard great things about the musical and I thought had talked to a bunch of people who had been to Broadway shows before kind of sussed through the ones that I had seen before here. And then other ones that I just didn't have an interest in seeing and kind of landed on Beetlejuice. I'd always wanted to watch Beetlejuice, but I had just never, never gotten around to it. I I even got like a 4k copy of it when they did a re-release last year. And I just seemed to miss it, but I finally sat down and watched it. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's the kind of movie where if you're thinking to watch it and it's not Halloween, you're probably going, yeah. oh, well, I'll just wait to watch it. And then you might forget to do it on Halloween. Yeah. But it's so good. It's it just is. such a fun thing to watch. The totally. characters are great. Mm-hmm. I distinctly remember that dad having the <laughs> bounciest, jugl- jugliest, jiggliest <laughs> butt I have ever oh seen. God. That thing is packing two wallets oh. aside. He can't go through <laughs> doors widthwise. He's got to turn. Ah, but it's a great oh. movie. It's, it's a fun time. Yeah. Fun characters. I really enjoy it. Yeah, it is, it's cool. And it's got so much practical effects and costumes, makeups, and like yeah. they have a little bit of CGI and you can pretty clearly see where they've masked out the green screen because there's this like green hue outline that they have. Mm-hmm. But like for the most part, they do so much practically, whether that's through just costumes or stop motion. Like they have like scenes where they're like stretching their faces yeah. to make themselves look scary. And they do that all practically with stop motion or with just like clever framing. And then they have the whole masks thing, which Mm -hmm. is just so unique because like they would look horrifying if they tried to make that photo real and tried to actually CGI that today. But because it's just like a goofy mask, like it looks fun still. Yeah, exactly. And I think I always thought that this movie was more scary than it was. No. So it might have been why I avoided it for so long. And because it, it's it's in that weird area where I never really knew what it was about. Mm-hmm. I knew that Michael Keaton was in it as Beetlejuice, but I didn't know anything about the whole plot of the family that dies in a car crash and now is stuck haunting their home and trying to haunt the the family that moves in afterwards out of the house. Yeah. And so it was that whole plot. I had no idea about. So it was kind of cool going in pretty much completely blind, except for the whole Michael Keaton of it all. Mm -hmm. But he's not even in it that much Beetlejuice. And I, that surprised me because I thought that being the name of the movie and being on the poster and being like the seemingly like the main character for him to be just kind of like, the villain in a yeah. sense it's it's it surprised me and who is the fucking lead Winona Ryder no not well not well Winona Ryder is in there which is yeah, surprising I can't remember, as well are you talking about like the oh, parents oh god Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin yeah Alec Baldwin uh so yeah like the whole Alec Baldwin plots and their relationship with Winona Ryder and even I forget his wife the the actress who plays the wife but she's also in stuff like A League of Their Own mm-hmm. and uh, there was another movie that she was in that was very big at the time but yeah it's just like a really fun movie and as soon as i finished it i texted molly who likes spooky stuff but doesn't like horror movies yeah and so when we recently watched hocus pocus she loved it and i when i watched this and i got kind of that same vibe i was like you'll love this oh it's it's, perfect it's really fun so yeah i would recommend it obviously this is not like the time of year for it but we'll be getting to that time of Mm -hmm. year pretty soon I think this episode comes out in September at some point. So like, yeah, in the yeah. next month it's it's worth putting on Beetlejuice. It's it's good that we're putting this out there now because mm-hmm. you, now the audience can remember to put this in their rotation. Yeah. Come Halloween time. We're putting out advance notice. Mm-hmm. 2022, 
you're the Beetlejuice. Yeah. <laughs> and next week, I'll tell you everything I thought about the Broadway show. So look I'm forward to that. I'm excited for that. Yeah. All right. Well, season three of Snubs and Dubs is covering the films from the year 2001. And so for episode four, we are talking about Spy Kids. Had you seen this before? I have seen this before as a child. I would hazard many times. Yeah. I watched this a lot and watching it again now as an adult, I remembered like 95% of it. <laughs> yeah. I could give you most, I could give you some of the dialogue lines. Yeah. Awesome. I didn't know that I knew it that well, but as soon as it was coming up, I knew everything that was going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is one of those where I, I had seen it before and I was the same where this was one that I definitely had like on VHS and DVD at some point too. That was just kind of on rotation on repeat. It was this one and the third one. I remembered the second one and I had to watch the trailer for the second one. Mm -hmm. Because I couldn't picture it. But then as soon as I saw the girl with the spinny ponytails and stuff, oh, I yeah. started piecing it together. But it was the first one and the third one, the 3D one, where they go into the video game that I watched all the time. And so it was really cool to revisit this. I haven't watched this one in a while. Yeah. I think the last time I watched it was when I was doing those summer camps. Oh, uh, yeah. Which was because it was just a good film to show to kids because it's, 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 it's a kids, it's it's a kids movie. movie. Yeah. Uh, was the last time you watched it? I don't remember. It was when I was still a child. It mm. could have been like 50. Years ago, <laughs> yeah. ballpark it somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember, but saw it a lot before that. Yeah. Before we get into how we thought of it as adults, before we get into anything, mm -hmm. what did you think of it as a kid? What was your, what, how do you remember thinking of it? I remember wanting to be them. Like I, re I remember really loving it and wanting to be a spy because yeah. it was like, they were doing all the things that you want to do as a kid. Of course. Playing with all the cool gadgets. Having yeah. warts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Going on like a jet pack, like flying through the air, like saving the world in spite of your parents being kidnapped. Like yeah. all the cool stuff that kids wish for. And it, it's a really good movie for kids. Like, oh, for yeah. sure. Because it gives them that sort of like sense of wish fulfillment and also sense of like you can do, you know, anything that you put your mind to. Yeah. And what I like is they're kids who solve problems in kid ways. Yeah. It feels it's a fun kid movie. I remember watching Ooh. that and being like, oh, man, this is so sick. Yeah. This is the height of <laughs> filmmaking. Oh, baby, I love it. I want to be cool like that. Well, not when I grow up, mm. but actually, I don't have much time to do this because I'm a child right now <laughs> thinking this dialogue. And if I want to be like that, I got to get moving. Yeah. Did the thumb thumbs terrify you as a child or did no. any of those fooglies terrify you? I thought they were all goofy enough that I, was, I didn't find them very scary. Yeah. OK. How about you? I don't know if they scare me, but I think so I have the, ingra the engraved yes. image of, mm -hmm. of the thumb thumbs, especially. But yeah. So anyways, if you were interested in Spy Kids, I've included the links to physical media related to it in the show notes. If you buy through that link, it'll help out our show. Or if you have any other Amazon shopping to do, follow the general link to help out our show in the process. A reminder that this is going to be a spoiler filled conversation. So if you haven't seen this movie yet and you want to go ahead and do so, I've also included time codes in the show notes so you can skip around to your heart's desire. But without further ado, let's get into it. Spy Kids is a 2001 American spy family action adventure comedy written and directed by Robert Rodriguez. It has quite the ensemble cast, actually. It stars Antonio Banderas as Gregorio Cortez, Carla Guino as Ingrid Cortez. Alan Cumming as Fegan Floop, Terry Hatcher as Miss Gradenko, Cheech Marin as Felix Gum, Danny Trejo as Isidore Machetti Cortez, Alexa Panavega as Carmen Cortez, Daryl Sabara as Juni Cortez, and a bunch of other cameos, including last week's star, fucking George Clooney's in this for like a minute. <laughs> yeah, at the very end, yeah. for a second, but in a really cool way. Yeah, I really like that scene. Also, Mike Judge and apparently Richard Linklater. What? <laughs> yeah, I, I read that online. I, I don't know. I think he's like a guard or something, but notable director of Boyhood last season, uh, School of Rock, Days and Confused. He just pops up in Spy Kids. OK. <laughs> OK, funny enough, as soon as I said who, I looked down at my screen because I happened to be on the Wikipedia page yeah. and I see Richard Linklater portrays cool spy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. I don't know which one's cool. <laughs> he must have been in like the wedding scene or something. Yeah, it must have been, must have been. It has a runtime of 85 minutes and it released on March 30th, 2001. Jason, what did you think of Spy Kids? I mean, it's a kid's movie. Yeah. I refuse to even be that hard on it because <laughs> yeah. of how much I watched it and enjoyed it as a kid. 
Totally. It nails it. If I was an adult watching this with my kids, I could withstand a number of watchings <laughs> before I burned it so they couldn't make me put it on again. Yeah. How about you, Kyle? I really enjoy it as well. I think it's super light and fluffy, you know, kind of akin to last episodes in a sense. I really commend what they were doing with practical effects, yeah. costumes. You know, we were just talking about Beetlejuice. They do a lot of that sort of same stuff here. But even CGI, obviously, when you watch it now, it's dated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a lot of things that they do that, like, don't look that great now. But given the time, like they went for it. They absolutely went all in on creating the visual aesthetic and creating this world and and making it as weird as possible Mm -hmm. and absolutely going for it. And I I totally respect them for that. And I think they pulled it off in terms of like what they wanted to do. And I think if this movie came out nowadays, it probably would have wanted to push that envelope as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just it's silly. Yeah. It's all it needs to be. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, do you want me to give you a little plot smack Sure. Down? Jason's going to read straight through the plot. If you don't need the refresher, you can skip right to the discussion by following the time codes in the show notes. But here's Spy Kids. Gregorio and Ingrid Cortez are spies with two children, Carmen and Junie, whom they shield from their lives to protect them from inherent danger. They work for the OSS doing office consultant work, but are suddenly called back to active field work to find missing agents. Gregorio suspects children's television host Fegan Floop has kidnapped them, mutating them into his Fooglies, creatures on his show. The children are left in the care of their uncle, Felix Gum. The couple is captured by Floop's Thumb Thumbs and taken to his castle. Felix is alerted to the parents' capture, activates the failsafe, and tells the children the truth about their parents and that he is not their uncle, but an agent sent to watch over them. I love the fake mustache pullout. Yeah. The house is attacked by Ninja Thumb Thumbs, and Felix is captured while the children escape alone on the submarine, the Nyx Super Guppy, set to autopilot to a safe house. Once at the safe house, the children discover their parents were spies and decide to rescue them. Inside Floop's castle, meanwhile, he introduces his latest creation to Mr. Lisp, small, child-shaped robots... They plan to replace the world's leader's children with the super strong robots to control the world. The androids have no artificial intelligence yet, so they can't function outside of their regular programming. Lisp is furious, demanding usable androids. Floop, with his second-in-command, Alexander Minion, interrogates Gregorio and Ingrid about the third brain. Ingrid knows nothing of it, while Gregorio claims he had destroyed the brain years ago. After Floop leaves, Gregorio reveals to Ingrid that the third brain was a secret OSS project he had worked on, an AI brain with all the skills of the entire OSS. The project was scrapped as being too dangerous, but Gregorio didn't want to destroy the final prototype. Back at the safe house, Carmen and Junie are visited by OSS agent Miss Gradenko. Giving Carmen a bracelet as a sign of trust, she asks about the third brain, but she doesn't know anything. Gradenko orders the house to be dismantled and Junie sees Ninja Thumbs outside destroying the submarine because she actually works for Floop. What? Ninja Thumbs, such a fun word. I know. (laughs) With Gradenko's intentions revealed, Junie accidentally exposes the third brain and a buddy pack chase ensues. Carmen gets the brain and she and Junie escape. She realizes too late that the bracelet from Gradenko has a tracking device and she and Junie are attacked by the robot counterparts. Though Junie tries to destroy it, he can't, so the robots take the third brain and fly away. Meanwhile, back at the castle, Gregorio tells Ingrid that Minion used to work for the OSS, but was fired after he reported him tampering with the third brain project. With it, Floop can achieve his goal, but instead he wishes to continue his children's show. Minion has different plans and takes over, locking Floop inside his virtual room, the chamber where he films his television series. Carmen and Junie receive reluctant help from Gregorio's estranged brother, Isidore Machete Cortez, when they show up at his spy shop. He refuses to accompany them, so they steal some gear and take his spy plane, the RX Express, to fly to Floop's castle. While the children infiltrate the castle, Junie rescues Floop, who helps him and Carmen release their parents. Together, they trap Minion in Floop's Fooglies machine, mutating him and confronting Lisp and Gradenko. The family is beset by all 500 robot children, but Machete busts through the window, reconciling with Gregorio and joining the family to fight. However, at the last moment, Floop reprograms the robots to change sides. The 500 super-strong robots quickly overpower Minion, Lisp, and Gradenko. 
With advice from Junie, Floop introduces the robot versions of Carmen and Junie on his show. At home sometime later, the family's breakfast is interrupted by Devlin, the head of the OSS, with a mission for Carmen and Junie. The children tell him that they will only accept if all the Cortezes can work on the mission together as a family. Wow. What a wholesome great message to end with yeah it's a great time i love the last scene with george clooney where he's got the bar over his eyes and i think it is an effect where they have the actual bar over it to block his eyes but then he just takes them off his sunglasses yeah. <laughs> such a cool effect and that would be such a funny actual sunglass thing to exist <laughs> and i bet you it yeah. does somewhere where it's just a black bar that yeah yeah but that that was funny and that's like kind of like higher up humor where like kids won't have the referential power to put mm-hmm. together what that's supposed to be <laughs> but the parents are like Huh. Good one, George Clooney, you sexy yeah. beast. <laughs> Obviously, this is a movie starring kids. What do you think of the child actors? Perfectly fine. Yeah. I would not have an issue with it. I thought like Junie's not amazingly acted, but also that role is so young that what are you going to do? Yeah, exactly. You, you're not looking to find the next. Oh, my God, I forgot his name. Daniel Radcliffe. You're not looking for the next <laughs> Daniel Radcliffe. You just need yeah. like a kid who works in that role. He does. It, I, I'm not going to complain about it. It's fine. What yeah. about you, Kyle? Yeah, I think they're totally great as well. I, I think the actress who does Carmen Cortez is really good. Like, she's got that same sort of, I mean, if we're comparing it to Harry Potter, she's got that similar Emma Watson, Hermione vibe where she's very, like, headstrong to the point. She knows what she wants. She's down to business. Mm-hmm. And uh, she pulls it off really well. But she also has some pretty good, like, emotional moments with her parents, which is, you know, which, what you yeah. need. I'd say hers is actually, like, pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the problem. adults go, pretty good cast as well, oh, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Antonio Banderas, I think, was just having a good time. He looked like he was just kind of having yeah. fun making <laughs> yeah. a kid's movie. And that's mm. fun to see on screen. And, of course, Alan Cumming is always great to see. He uh, really did a a knockout job in yeah. that in that role. Yeah, totally. Because he's a complicated character in a sense. Where he, he somehow <laughs> is. Like, this is yeah. for a dumb kid's movie with, like, ninja thumb yeah. people. The villain actually has a structure. Yeah, he has like a journey a, a he conflict. goes on through this. Yeah. yeah, He wants to focus on his show. He's doing this robot stuff with the minion just to kind of like maybe get funding for his show in it's, a sense. Yeah, it seems like this was the way he could get funding and mm. the way to make the characters he wants for his show. Totally. But it, uh, yeah, he doesn't want to. And then when he gets an out and when uh, Junie basically believes in him and tells him mm-hmm. to do the right thing, he changes. It's it's really fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's kind of like some guy who does like makes balloons for kids on the street corner getting mob funding. Like it's a weird <laughs> yeah. lineup to have in that business scenario, but yeah. I guess it works and mm-hmm. he can continue the show afterwards somehow. Yeah. So whatever. Good for him. Which what I was confused about was uh, if the children were meant to resemble the presidents and like world leaders children mm-hmm. and they're like these anonymous children are saving the day and now like they're also having these children on the tv shows wouldn't somebody recognize the son of like a president well i don't think they add any of those kids onto the show it's just carmen and juni who okay. make unless there's something in the subsequent because movies. like they show on tv that some kids are saving the day like they're saving people oh, from fires true. and stuff and they're like it seems like not another day goes by where a kid does a amazing feat and they're like, yeah, but it's the president's son. And why yeah. is the president's son got this duplicate? And why is he doing these deeds? And what oh, he doesn't speak and what's going on? But yeah, yeah, that seems like a ticking time bomb. Like eventually <laughs> someone's kid's going to cross into the wrong geopolitical lines. And now there's like a giant war breaking out because of some yep. diplomacy breakdown. Possibly. <laughs> Now I want that movie. Yeah. <laughs> Spy Kids 4D World at War. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it is interesting for Robert Rodriguez to do this movie because I don't know if you're familiar with him outside of the Spy Not Kids particularly. movies. Because like while he did like the first three Spy Kids movies and he did them pretty much one a year for 2001, 2002, 2003, I think all of his movies prior to this were R-rated. Oh, interesting. And From Dusk Till Dawn was a 1996 movie that Quentin Tarantino wrote that he directed. Quentin Tarantino also starred in it, but that was an R-rated movie. And he also directed, prior to this, The Faculty. I talked about it a couple seasons ago as something I watched for Halloween. It stars Elijah Wood, and it was the one about the aliens who were slowly taking over the faculty of a school. That one was also R-rated. 
but then he made like a hard cut. Like Spike Is was his first PG one. <laughs> but since then, he's done things like Sin City and also in the same year, Adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl. <laughs> so this guy, uh, he's all over the place, but I am here for it. And did you know about Machete? Oh, yeah, because isn't that like... He's Machete. Yeah, he's yeah. Machete. And like the Machete movie didn't come out until 2010, but that is also R rated. Like, Wikipedia calls it an exploitation action film, and the cover has a lot of guns and some women. And so it's interesting that that same character is also in this Spy Kids movie. Yeah, because when I obviously when I first watched it, Machete didn't exist outside this, so I, there was no idea that was coming. But yeah. now rewatching this, I'm like, oh, that's actually Machete. But I couldn't remember when, yeah. what year Machete came out. So I was like, <laughs> is it from before? And this is just like a really funny usage of a very violent <laughs> character because that is a boss move. Like, yeah. I have like some, this is James Bond and then not reference that he's committed many murders. <laughs> Yeah. And like the action scenes in this are really fun. Like they're really well crafted and just a good watch. I don't Mm -hmm. know if it's like my favorite kids movie by any means. I think that it can be kind of slow sometimes, even though it's only 90 minutes. And like the plot is pretty nice and easy. Yeah. Which when we get to my scores later, I do kind of reflect that because I didn't get the same like glowing feeling that maybe Mm -hmm. I would have as watching this as a kid. And that's just on an adult now watching a kid's movie. I do obviously have nostalgia for it. So that might be bumping some of my score up. But there was some audiences that we'll get to that. But let's just say that there was a little bit of disagreement there when i was going through and watching it like normally i just take like some point form notes of things that i've noticed in the movie the only thing i wrote down for this movie is those cgi shark guys (laughs) got me fucked up (laughs) those were wrong i don't know what shark eyes look like but from my reaction to seeing those it's not that (laughs) it was a bizarre choice yeah that was fun yeah Mm -hmm. well do you want to get into the critics and audiences score of it let's Hit it. All right. I want you to take a guess. Not, I mean, you can guess at the exact number, but quickly guess which score do you think is higher, the critic's score or the audience score? Oh, that's really tough. I feel like for some reason the critics are going to score this higher than audiences because it was just a competently made kids movie. Mm-hmm. That's my, I'm, I'm not going to hazard the scores. I have okay. no idea. But I think critics going to be higher for some reason. Sure. You were right. Nice. Critics actually gave us a 93% on Rotten what? Tomatoes. Yeah. That's, I would not have started with a nine. <laughs> I was thinking like this might win in the 70s to low yeah. 80s. Well, and I remember when I was making the schedule for this season, Spike Kids popped up and I was like, oh yeah, that's a fun one. Clicked on it and I saw that it was so high. And mm-hmm. so I was like, oh, well, obviously I got to throw that one in if it's so high. Yeah. A further digging would find that the audience score for Rotten Tomatoes is a 46%. That's insanely yeah. low. Oh my God. Yeah. It doesn't deserve that kind of hate. <laughs> right? I, it's a difficult to dislike movie, yeah. I guess. I, I don't, don't know. know. IMDb, 5.6. So on the user side, pretty low. Yeah. And to kind of nail in that point, Metacritic is a 71. I don't understand audiences who are watching <laughs> Spy Kids, the 2001 <laughs> movie, and are thinking like, "Oh, this doesn't hold up. Oh, there's yeah. no, oh, there's no love interest. Mm, there's no complicated character arc. Mm, I've seen better fights before. Mm, I'm gonna score this a, a 40. Like it's a kids movie. Yeah, understand what you're watching. Yeah, I feel like people just wanted to hit on this for some reason. I guess so because it is just kind of like corny. Yeah, but I mean just. Relax. Have some fun. It's, it's a kid's spy movie. Kids. Lower the bar for this. It's not <laughs> meant for you. It's meant for your children. Yeah, exactly. I also thought this movie deserved a lot more meme life than it's been given. Mm. It's never gotten anything, but it's yeah. a movie that like a lot of people who are chronically online of our general age that have seen it. Oh, yeah, definitely. As for box office, though, on a budget of $35 million, it made $197 million. At the worldwide box office that year. Damn, good for Spy Kids. Yeah, it landed at number 22 for the year, which for an original IP of a kid's movie. That's actually, I'm impressed. Yeah. Yeah. Good work, Spy Kids. Apparently it stayed number one in the US box office for three weeks straight. Hmm. So good for them. And released at the end of March, you said? Yeah. That's not even like primetime summer break. <laughs> yeah. That's really pulling its weight there. Yeah. And I mean, it's probably no surprise that they got greenlit for... Two more sequels directly after that. Oh, I'm shocked it stopped at two. It didn't. 
Because I think there's one in the works from I, what I saw. In the there IMDb was a page. fourth one. Oh, uh, I don't know if Robert Rodriguez did it. He might have, but I know there was a fourth one, and it was somewhat recently. But let's get to our scores, though. What did you rate this for your enjoyment? I mean, it's tough to rate a kid's movie. So I'm trying to find the middle ground of where I think of it now and what I thought of it as a kid. I think that's a fair way to do that. And for that, I'm slapping down a four. I love this Hmm. movie as a kid. Yeah, totally. How about you? I gave this a three. I didn't (laughs) consider my childhood that much when doing this, but I do think that it is a relatively enjoyable movie to put on. And I think a really easy movie for kids to watch. So, Mm -hmm. And if you're putting it on with your kids, you're probably going to have a decent enough time. Yeah. Craft. Craft, I'm going to give this a 3.5. I think they have a lot of fun with it. The Fooglies are a good time. They clearly put a lot of care into this. They've gone out of their way to make good experience. So that's getting Mm -hmm. a 3.5 in my book. Skyle, what are you thinking? I actually gave this a 4. Again, I really commend them for their practical effects and their visual effects push. But also the score, actually really good. It was actually pretty good. And Danny Elfman did the score for this movie, which was very surprising because I did not know that he had his name on this. But yeah, he did. I mean, I at least saw on the credits that he did the original theme. So Hmm. yeah, that's a good theme. Yeah. You know, the way you've spoken of it, I retconned them before now. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> execution writing, I'm, acting for execution i'm giving this a three it was good it was yeah. not anything blow my socks off but it's a three for me mm-hmm. i also gave it a three i think that the acting is totally fine and the writing overall is perfect for what it needed to be so that's three yeah lastly rewatchability uh, for rewatchability i am going to slap down a 2.5 i can't see myself watching this again, but I watched it a lot as a kid. So there's yeah. the middle ground there. What are you thinking? I gave this a two. Uh, also from that logic that I can't really see myself watching this again as an adult, but I could see this myself putting this on for a kid yeah. or suggesting it for somebody's kids. But yeah, they're probably busy watching their freaking Paw Patrol or Peppa Pig or whatever is <laughs> popular. Coco <Cocoa> Melon. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right, Kyle, you have given this a 12 out of 20 for a 60%, and I have given this a 13.5 out of 20 for a 68%. You're higher than I thought I was going to be. Yeah. I didn't do math before this, mm. but I like it. <laughs> let, me, let me throw down your rankings here, Kyle. Okay. You probably haven't forgotten yet, but yeah. the audience may have. Mm-hmm. Top to bottom, Memento, Ocean's Eleven, Harry Potter, where is Spy Kids? This is going right to the bottom, actually. Uh, not to the bottom, I didn't see the extent when we did, what was the movie called? Uh, um, are you thinking about the- Sling Blade. <laughs> not to the extent oh. where we absolutely meteored Sling Blade yeah. to the bottom of the rankings before we even gave it a chance. This is just a safe, this is not as good as the other three that we've talked about so, so far this season. Wow, I really had to strain for Sling Blade. I remember the voice. <laughs> Some call it a Sling Blade. <laughs> for me, Marvin's Room was more egregious oh, yeah. of being a terrible movie. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm also putting this as number four. No yeah. surprise. I think a lot of these movies are going to be sliding down, but probably together. Yeah. I don't think much is going to slide in mm-hmm. between some of these. It, yeah. Totally. It's also hard to rank a kid's movie as yeah. an adult. Yeah. I also don't know, like... I can't envision what's going to be that much worse, though, as far as the season, though. I can imagine Mm. one. (laughs) I know for sure one that's going to be a fucking chore to (laughs) go through. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I hate that movie. Oh, my God. It's not even up for a while. (laughs) This is a sneak peek. This is like check back in several It's it's my theory of everything this season. (laughs) It's holy fuck. I... At the end of every episode, dread. Okay. Fun letterbox <laughs> reviews. This has a score of 2.9 out of 5 on Letterbox. Why? Again, audiences. Why what is going on? Are people taking the time out of their day to hate <laughs> this movie? It's an 85 minute long kids movie. Yeah. <laughs> Grow up. Anyways, I got three high reviews and one bad review because they were where the flavor was at. Five stars on a rewatch by Tara. Alan Cumming should have won an Oscar for this, to be honest. <laughs> That's so brave. (laughs) That is such a bold statement, and I support that. I saw that. I was like, I mean, we're asking those questions, but I don't know. I don't know if he needed that. (laughs) I think he might. Oh, really? Okay. We'll see. You're on that to the spray. I like the boldness of that statement. (laughs) Okay. All right, Tara, you've uh, stirred the pot here at Snaps and Dubs. Another five star on a rewatch by Lindsay. Me, as soon as the thumb thumbs appeared on screen. Oh, I didn't know Channing Tatum was in this. 
That is really good. <laughs> Especially coming off of Foxcatcher when he looked like the most thumb of a human being. Like he was a thick boy. Oh my god. He would get five thumbs up in this. Man, how good would those guys be at tech decking? (laughs) Tech deck world champs. Oh my god. Four stars by Sammy. People always talk about how bad the CGI is in Spy Kids, but somehow failed to mention the fact that Ingrid Cortez single handedly invented being a MILF. She was the first entry in a long catalog (laughs) afterwards. A lot of people have followed the path of being an absolute milf. (laughs) I actually have a a, a fact about her being a a bit of a milf later, but we'll get to that. I can't wait. All right. Uh, Lastly, one star by My Blood is Film. (laughs) (laughs) You're watching Spy Kids, my guy. (laughs) He simply has to say, kids can't be spies. (laughs) (laughs) Why not? (laughs) Wait, is there a law to stop them? Spies are already illegal. (laughs) That's weird. Oh, well. All right. Academy Awards. I think you can feather a guess that this didn't get any Academy Awards. I would hazard that this didn't get anything, but maybe got some like kids choice something something or whatever. It was actually nominated for the Saturn Award for Best Fantasy Film. Didn't win. Eh, That's Uh, still cute. But Robert Rodriguez won the American Latino Media Arts Award for Outstanding Director in a Motion Picture. That was kind of all it got. But good for him. Good for him. Yeah. And this was great for a Latino representation at the time too. It was. So. Yeah. That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's my facts. Straight off with the MILF fact. Yes. All right. Carla Gugino was reluctant to accept the role of Ingrid Cortez. Gugino felt she was too young at the age of 29 to have an eight-year-old boy and a 12-year-old daughter as her children. Director Robert Rodriguez told her that his own mother had had him and all of his siblings by the time she was 30, and they were a similar age as the kids in the movie. Gugino was reassured and ultimately accepted the role as Ingrid Cortez. Oh, that makes sense. She also looks older than that in the movie. I wouldn't have pegged her as being 29. It might be the haircut. Yeah, that adds like six years itself. (laughs) But not in a bad way. No, totally. And it's interesting to see that obviously Robert Rodriguez wrote this. And so like he put a little piece of his family in there. Like they're all spies. Yeah. Even though this is like a fact about how she was a MILF, but like it's interesting to show how Robert Rodriguez had a piece of that. Yeah. And the reason that she was reassured was because of that. Yeah. Because his mom was a MILF. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. This is the last Robert Rodriguez movie he shot on film. Mm. Post-production was done at George Lucas's Skywalker Ranch, where he introduced Rodriguez to high-definition digital filmmaking. Interesting. Yeah. Game changer. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you can't get 3D without it, Mm. so... Yeah, I think and Robert Rodriguez and George Lucas have been kind of, like, tight for a little while, because Robert Rodriguez now is involved in some of the Star Wars stuff, like Book of Boba Fett, I think. Yeah, I saw that he did a couple books of Boba Fett and yeah. a little Mandalorian yeah. slipped in. It's cool, because he's also tight with Quentin Tarantino as well. All right. Robert Rodriguez said he went with Alexa Vega to see Mission Impossible 2 in 2000, just before they started filming Spy Kids. He leaned over to her halfway through and said, you're going to be so much cooler than Tom Cruise. <laughs> no, she's not. <laughs> it's not close. You ever see her make it to Top Gun? (laughs) You see her doing her own crazy stunts? You don't hold a candle to Tom Cruise. Get out. Oof, that struck a nerve with you. (laughs) I just, she thinks she can step to him. He was just trying to give her a little I don't care, don't lie to children. gassing her tires a little bit. (laughs) Wrongly, illegally, you don't do that to our King Tom Cruise. (laughs) All right. Lastly, Brie Larson and Elizabeth Olsen, two very famous people now, both auditioned for the role of Carmen Cortez. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, any final thoughts? You know what, Spy Kids? It's a movie about spies. (laughs) It's for kids. It's Spy Kids. (laughs) It surely is. Yeah, but you've got yeah um, yeah i don't know it's fun i don't know if you see these type of movies nowadays like not to this extent where they got all the weird goofy practical effects and costumes and stuff like i wish we could see more of that yeah that needs to make a little bit of a comeback that'd be cool let's yeah. get more fooglies let's get more thumb ninjas <laughs> every yes. movie should have at least one thumb ninja i want a thumb ninja spinoff starring oh. chatting tatum <laughs> 
<laughs> all right. Well, I want to thank you guys all for listening to season three, episode four of Snubs and Dubs. As always, you can find us everywhere on social media at Snubs and Dubs. That's on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Letterboxd, etc. We're also on Good Pod, so make sure to check us out there and join our official Discord. We'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on Spy Kids or on this episode. So please send us a tweet or a message with a question, recommendation, or anything else. I'm also at Kyle Tobison on Twitter, and Jason is at Windy underscore Mills. Of course, all of those links will be in the show notes. Make sure to leave a five star review, share the show to everyone you know, and check back next week for another episode. Here's a sneak peek of the film we're going to talk about. At the country house of Sir William McCordell, the guests are wealthy. If I wanted coffee, I'd have rung for it. Who thinks he's God Almighty? They all do. Privileged. Ooh, yummy. What's she like to work for? She's a snobbish cow. Famous. Mr. Weissman's very odd. Apparently, he produces motion pictures. Hello, I'm Morris Weissman. Who? That's right. Next time, we're talking about the first Best Picture nominee this season, Godsford Park. So make sure to watch it before next episode. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. Thanks for listening. That's a wrap. Bye. Bye for now. Bye.